Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Today we are going to talk about uh, automation test failure classification uh, using machine learning. Uh, this is Anuradha Kunduri. I have been working as software uh, engineer in test with uh, Expedia Group for more than uh, two years now. And I'm joined uh, here today by my colleague uh, Kirtika, who is a senior ops and traffic analyst uh, with Expedia Group. So today we are going to uh, talk about how machine learning could uh, uh, help us categorize the automation uh, uh, errors into, uh, into multiple categories. So let's get uh, started with the uh, introduction section. So first, let's uh, talk about the problem statement. So uh, when we look at the automation failures, we are not always quite confident if they can be directly reported as actual bugs or not. And I can say this from my uh, experience uh, uh, being in testing for almost five years now. So. Uh, this uh, doesn't essentially mean that the uh, automation test cases are uh, flaky, but uh, it could be due to several other reasons like the environment stability issues or unavailability of uh, inventory, or it could be the setup issues, runtime issues, or uh, in fact, even automation uh, issues like uh, uh, locators and so on. So because the automation failures could have uh, other reasons as well, uh, teams tend to ignore the results altogether, uh, thus defeating the whole purpose of having uh, automation in place. Also, uh, engineers spend a lot of time in analyzing the failures to determine if they are actual bugs or not. And with the number of failures being very high, uh, it becomes quite uh, difficult to analyze the uh, root cause of each and every failure. And uh, these days with microservices architecture and with uh, CICD pipelines uh, in place, it is uh, quite uh, difficult to uh, analyze the uh, failures uh, for each and every build that happens uh, mostly for every uh, commit and uh, to determine if they are actual bugs or not. So this is the problem statement that we are targeting. We want to reduce the time that an engineer has to spend to uh, to determine if the automation uh, failure is uh, actual bugs or not by, by analyzing and looking into each and every failure. So now let's uh, talk about the complexity of the problem that we have in hand. So uh, different teams could use multiple uh, frameworks which are implemented in uh, different uh, programming languages depending on uh, their particular uh, uh, requirement. And uh, depending up upon the framework that was used, the automation failure messages could be quite different. And uh, another thing is the test specification methodology. That is the way the test scenarios are defined. And one of the prominent methodologies which we uh, have in use in recent times is the BDD way of defining the scenarios. And this would also determine how the final automation failure would look like. And another thing is uh, customized failure messages at uh, multiple levels of the automation uh, system. Uh, thus causing the uh, failure message to look different. So now given an automation failure, uh, it could arise from multiple layers. So let's talk about them. So the uh, first layer is the automation test code itself. And a layer below that, we have the libraries uh, using which the automation was built. And in a layer below that, uh, we have the framework that was used to build the automation. And uh, in a layer below that, uh, only in case of uh, UI automation test cases, we have the Selenium web driver. And uh, in the bottommost layer, we have the programming language that was used to build the uh, automation uh, test cases. So now, uh, depending upon the uh, layer from which the failure could arise, the automation failure message could look quite different. And also, there is uh, some level of uh, customization that is possible at each of these layers for the uh, uh, for the failure message. So now you could see that it is practically very uh, difficult to find a, a common pattern among the failure messages that could uh, help us in their analysis or gaining insights. 
So now let's talk about the uh, desired uh, uh, capabilities for the solution uh, that we would want to solve the problem that we have at hand. So obviously, the solution uh, should be able to automatically detect patterns among the failure messages to uh, provide us uh, certain uh, insights or the categorization. And uh, like we discussed earlier, uh, different automation frameworks could be used and hence the solution should remain agnostic and uh, be able to uh, provide the categorization for uh, different frameworks. Also, the solution uh, should be uh, extensible to any future frameworks that the teams could uh, use depending on their particular uh, uh, requirement. And the next thing is, when we look at automation uh, failure message, it could contain two parts, like the uh, automation description or the summary and the uh, stack trace. Now, we could argue that uh, we could use only the automation failure as uh, input to the solution and ignore the stack trace. But from our uh, experience with the automation failures, which we have seen within uh, Expedia, uh, sometimes the failure description uh, could not be available. And uh, sometimes we have seen that the stack trace could have certain uh, useful uh, information that could be used for providing the insights regarding the failure. So because of these reasons, we have decided to uh, go ahead with the entire failure message, including the stack trace as input to the solution. And thus, now our solution should have the ability to work with this entire message, which is now an unstructured message. And uh, next, the solution should be able to adapt itself to any new failures that could be arising out of the uh, frameworks for which the solution is already in use. And last but not the least, the solution should have uh, high reliability because this would determine the confidence with which the teams would use the solution's outputs of uh, analysis for the automation failures. Now, uh, keeping in mind uh, all these reasons, we have decided to, uh, to use machine learning as our uh, solution for uh, the problem that we uh, have in hand and to provide us predictions. So, uh, now my colleague uh, Kirtika would be talking about the uh, solution more in detail. Hello everyone, this is Kirtika. Uh, I've been with Expedia since past two years and working as, as a senior analyst uh, in uh, IOTA. So uh, as my colleague Anuradha talked about the problem that we had and uh, the, the outline that we have created to understand our problem. So uh, with the problem statement and all the analysis, we identified uh, like uh, how can we solve our problem. So we created a solution outline and we could able to with the deep uh, uh, with the deep analysis, we could able to identify that this problem is a good fit for the machine learning because uh, our data is like that our data is basically uh, 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 promoting uh, promoting it to the you know uh, the classification cate uh, classification category of machine learning because we already knew our data we are very much familiar with our data and we have like we know that what uh, we want from the data so uh, we uh, uh, widely has the four classes in all the test uh, test uh, error messages that we get so one is the inventory so whenever there is uh, some item unavailable uh, then there uh, it then an inventory error shoots up so and then uh, there is an automation error as on radha previously talked about like whenever there is a non existing element on the page or something like that then there comes the environment uh, there are many downstream and the backend services that are running to running to power up the ui and everything so that is actually if if something goes wrong with those uh, uh, those downstream services then environment uh, uh, error shoots up then there is a product so it is actually uh, the error that a customer faces on the final ui of our uh, expedia site so uh, before uh, moving ahead with the ML, we have to uh, plan it accordingly because, uh, as you can understand, that uh, there is multiple steps to, you know, solve a problem via ML. We can't just throw the problem to ML. So, uh, first uh, and the very important thing of this uh, solution outline is we have to collect errors and classify them manually to provide a source of truth to our model. 
then we have to identify the correct algorithms so there is multiple algorithm available for our uh, uh, for the problems like there are text classification algorithm there are uh, uh, categorization algorithm there are uh, there are multiple algorithm i would say and then we have to do provide the proof of concept to finally you know uh, upgrade our uh, upgrade our solution outline into a product so after that we create an machine learning end to end flow and then automate everything because right now it is a very manual process where uh, a tester has to go there and has to select one of the category on which that particular error message belongs then we have to keep adding more pre classified data and keep fine tuning uh, this step is very important for any machine learning uh, technique that we are using or any machine learning environment if we are setting up because if data gets stale then uh, it is more prone to you know more prone uh, towards biasing and overfitting then there is uh, then we the very end the consume the model so we are planning to you know uh, give it uh, wherever in uh, in our expedia expedia is a very big organization and uh, there are there is uh, and we are producing a lot of um, uh, data so we are basically uh, will be able to make it robust and scalable to consume the ml model so in the very first step uh, first step the data collection step so as you could see on your screen this is how uh, one of the error message that looks like so uh, this uh, so one of the test framework pulls this message and uh, uh, put it into the dashboard and um, uh, and tester has to go there and select the categories manually by understanding the message like from uh, in which category it falls into so uh, this is how and from this uh, uh, this uh, monger this is basically the mongodb backend so we are basically collecting our data from mongodb and we are classifying them manually for the uh, for to provide the source of truth or to create our training data so this is our data preparation this is how our data looks like so this is an error message i could see uh, as you could see we don't have much dimensions in our data our data is like two dimensional data with multi class uh, uh, with multi class problem so this is an error message uh, one column is an error message another dimension is like prediction where the uh, pre predicting category or the where the this error message falls into ne in next step we have to uh, do some of the data cleaning like there are multiple punctuation uh, multiple uh, html tags that comes uh, in the message but we uh, to identify like uh, exactly where that message belongs to like for example the inventory if something is out of uh, if something is out of stock if it is not able to you know uh, it is not able to call the inventory uh, for a particular item then there must be a particular error message that is thrown uh, by the app but the thing is that uh, uh, in the in the test that are running we are getting the whole uh, stack trace so uh, we'll be dealing with the stack trace in uh, when we will mature our model but uh, as for the proof of concept we have removed all the um, all the extra punctuation and uh, tags and only kept the important message or the plain text message that was relevant next we have evaluated multiple algorithms for uh, on our cleaned data so as you could see on your screen like there are multiple uh, algorithms that we have created uh, that we have tested on like naves and support vector and so on so uh, we finally uh, was able to uh, stop at the support vector machine with the term frequency feature so it was uh, it was giving us an accuracy of 72% so uh, it was good for the proof of concept but as you know it is not very good for the production and it is not reliable for an engineer because uh, a human can uh, do the error uh, human can you know human uh, human error rate is around 95 or 96 percent if he is working as a job uh, doing a job and, uh, and and doing it regularly so why he would use our he or she would use our product so we have to uh, identify like why the accuracy is not up to the mark why it is not reliable and uh, so we uh, have to uh, so now so far we have evaluated the model now we have to evaluate our data like what is wrong with data so as we have evaluated our data was uh, like not in very balanced shape like few of the categories was having uh, uh, very little values while a few of the categories having huge value for example uh, product uh, does not have much uh, uh, does not have much errors uh, instead the uh, i would say automation or some internal uh, error 
will also shoot up like uh, have the multiple errors so uh, in the end so we could identify that there is an uh, uh, data challenge and there is an issue of biasing and overfitting of the model so next we have to uh, fine tune our ml model and also you know clean the data uh, so to uh, so for cleaning up for the cleaning up the data we have like used multiple techniques like cost sensitive technique generated synthetics samples tree based algorithm semi supervised learning and all so i will go by one by one uh, so cost sensitive learning is like uh, assigning the cost and everything uh, though the model assigns the cost itself uh, on the whenever uh, whenever it classifies uh, that will that comes under uh, fine tuning but to improve our data to we have assigned um, uh, we have assigned uh, constants to our uh, to the most favored word in most favored word in an error message so there is usually uh, you know, we have already seen multiple errors and uh, it's a very uh, uh, it's a very uh, matured uh, expedia is a very matured platform so we know that what uh, what uh, what are the patterns already so uh, next uh, next step is the synthetic samples so generating synthetic sample is basically when uh, wherever uh, uh, the bars are not meeting so we are basically filling up extra space of comments so that we'll be able to you know uh, uh, label uh, level up the all the categories now there are tree based and model assembling uh, it is basically the machine learning technique uh, machine learning modeling technique but we have used it to uh, uh, to balance out the data by you know um, uh, adding the feedback loop and all so semi supervised learning is basically so so far we were going through a supervised learning but in the end we identified that few of the patterns to actually tackle complete message we have to uh, go by and understanding the patterns of the message like uh, like to uh, and the find out the similarity factor between the two uh, message or the two records or the two data points for that we had to go by the semi supervised learning furthermore uh, the model tuning parts now we have like balanced out our data somehow and we were like uh, uh, we are like uh, moving forward with the model tuning so uh, we used uh, the model assembling at we were maturing our uh, technique so we uh, ended up with the model assembling techniques where we combine the model break the model and get the result out of it and then we again you know uh, keep on keep on keep on there is multiple iterations that we do to get our results so uh, we have used like random forest voting classifier and so on but in the end we have uh, we stopped at xg boost where uh, our accuracy was like very much uh, promising and uh, we were able to uh, you know uh, and it was very good for the production so currently we are using like semi supervised learning for uh, data cleaning and for imbalance part and the xgboost classifier that could classify our errors and which will actually give us the better recall and the precision values so this is the final uh, fine tuning uh, that uh, that gave us the result accuracy score of 97% and precision of around 69 so this is 69% precision is for the product and uh, and so the further we have divided the category wise uh, uh, accuracy and all so uh, as you could see the hyper the most important thing is the hyper parameter values that we have assigned to the fine tuning and we have identified uh, during the process for example the maximum depth depth of the tree is equal to 13 and the uh, learning rate what should be the learning rate what should be the feature selection percent etc so there are multiple things that are under that comes uh, under the fine tuning part so it is a continuous process yes because we are uh feeding more and more data and the new patterns are also coming uh, new errors are also coming as the new applications are being developed uh, continuously so yes we are uh, uh, we are keep on so these uh, parameters are prone to change and also uh, for the improvement uh, also prone to change for the improvement as well so our final uh, metrics with the 30% split and the two different seed like the 30% will be the training data and 20% will be the testing data and so on so uh, it is like the we have got the accuracy of 97% which is which is very 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 promising so uh, so so and it it was good and it was uh, it was good to put into the production so that is why uh, our next uh, step is to deploy our model and uh, uh, set up a endpoint so that everyone could use it so that part will be taken up by uh, my colleague anuradha anuradha over to you 
Thanks, Kirtika. Um, hi, everyone. So uh, now we are going to uh, talk about uh, regarding the model deployment and uh, endpoint uh, setup. So uh, we want our uh, trained model to be uh, exposed as a service through an API uh, endpoint where the error message uh, could be uh, given as input to the API endpoint and the API endpoint could uh, talk to the trained and deployed model and get back the uh, inference or the prediction and uh, send it back as um, uh, API uh, response. Uh, we want to expose the model as a service um, to uh, for its uh, uh, simplicity of usage because the model uh, could be invoked to get the uh, prediction as an API endpoint from any piece of code. So now let's uh, talk about in uh, detail how we have achieved this. So the primary uh, technology that we have used to uh, uh, to expose the uh, model and uh, to uh, train and deploy it is uh, SageMaker. So SageMaker uh, allows us to uh, put our uh, model code into a, uh, into a custom container, which could be trained and uh, run within the SageMaker environment. So the first step would be to uh, create the Docker image with our model code. So uh, SageMaker uh, provides a, a default uh, container structure which already has a Flask uh, service that serves as the uh, web app and an Nginx uh, server. And uh, all we need to do is uh, put in our model training and inference code and uh, build the Docker image. So once the Docker image is built, there's an invocations endpoint uh, that gets exposed within the uh, Docker image. So once the Docker image is built, uh, SageMaker uh, uh, provides us uh, with uh, uh, training and uh, and inference uh, scripts using which we could test on local. And these scripts uh, basically uh, mimic the way how SageMaker would call the training and inference uh, process within the uh, actual SageMaker environment. So, okay, now once we have uh, built our image and tested the training and uh, inference part, the next step would be to uh, push the model uh, image to Amazon ECR, which is the Elastic Container Registry. And in the next step, uh, we want to make our uh, training data uh, available to SageMaker and we have chosen uh, Amazon S3 for this purpose. So we put our training data into S3 and uh, in the next step, we can go ahead and uh, create the SageMaker uh, training job. So the uh, the inputs that the SageMaker would need is the full path to the uh, model uh, Docker image that we have pushed earlier to ECR along with any uh, tag names, which is useful to uh, uniquely identify the particular model image. And the second input is the training data path in S3. And the third input is the desired location where the trained model artifacts should be stored. So uh, now with these inputs, once the SageMaker uh, training job is created, SageMaker runs the training and the trained model artifacts are pushed to uh, S3. So uh, these trained model artifacts are nothing but it, it's a pic uh, it will be in a pickle file format, which is like a serialized form of the uh, trained model. Now, once we have the trained model artifacts uh, available in S3, in the next step, we can go ahead and create the SageMaker environment. The prerequisite for uh, invoking the SageMaker en uh, endpoint is it can be invoked only within a SageMaker runtime environment. So as the next step, we can go ahead and uh, uh, test the SageMaker uh, endpoint within the SageMaker runtime uh, environment to see if you are able to uh, fetch the predictions from the uh, deployed model. So now as a next step, uh, we want to uh, uh, make the model uh, available as an endpoint. So we have achieved this using AWS API Gateway and AWS Lambda. So the Lambda would have the code to create the SageMaker runtime environment, uh, invoke the SageMaker endpoint with the error message input that it gets from the API Gateway. And the SageMaker endpoint would in turn talk to the uh, trained and uh, trained model and get back the uh, inference, uh, which is nothing but the prediction, and send it back to AWS Lambda. So Lambda would append this prediction 
to the uh, error message that was received as input and send it back to API Gateway. And API Gateway uh, sends this back as the uh, API response. So here you could see the sample API response where uh, this is the input error message that was received and uh, the environment is the prediction that was populated using the modal endpoint. So now that we have the uh, model uh, created, let's talk about uh, the model endpoint uh, usage uh, within Expedia. So uh, within Expedia, the automation test cases are, are run as part of uh, CI-CD uh, pipeline, which is set up using Jenkins. And uh, for every test case run, there's an uh, there's a test record that, that gets created with uh, all the uh, information regarding that particular test case run, which gets pushed to uh, Elasticsearch and can be visualized using Kibana. So now let's uh, look at a sample snapshot of uh, the test run data from uh, Kibana. Uh, in this particular uh, data, I have queried uh, uh, only for the scenarios which have failed. And here you can see the field scenario name and the uh, status, which obviously is failed here, and the line of business uh, for which this particular uh, scenario was executed. And the next one is the error message or the failure message. And uh, we have here a field called an uh, page failure message. We will talk about this in a bit. And uh, we have the framework uh, field um, using which the, the particular test case was built. And finally, we have the prediction field. And this is the field that gets populated for each test case run from the modal endpoint that was created. So now let's talk about in detail how these predictions are getting populated. So fetching the predictions from the modal uh, endpoint. So for every uh, test case run, depending on the framework using which the automation was built, there's a result file that gets generated uh, either in JSON or, uh, or HTML format. And for every uh, test case run, we have a processing module that gets uh, invoked. And uh, this processing module is uh, responsible for, for getting all the details uh, regarding the particular test case run and uh, creating a JSON record with all the details, which is finally pushed to uh, Elasticsearch. So now let's talk about what happens when the uh, scenario fails. So when the scenario fails, this processing module would get the failure message or the error message from the uh, from the result file. And uh, now there's another uh, optional uh, uh, input called page failure message. So in case of uh, Expedia site uh, pages, uh, uh, again, this is applicable only in case of uh, UI automation test cases. So uh, whenever uh, there's a backend process failure or a backend service failure, sometimes there's a custom a page failure message that gets displayed uh, to the user and which we uh, call as the page failure message. So in case of uh, UI automation test cases, whenever this page failure message is available, and when it was included in the training data, uh, we have seen uh, that the model performed really well as it, it could gain certain insights from this custom message, uh, which is taken from the UI itself. So uh, because of this reason, uh, even in the uh, inference or the prediction part as well, the processing module uh, fetches this page failure uh, message from the uh, browser for the particular test case run whenever available and appends it to the beginning of the uh, error message and sends this uh, whole message as input to the modal API and uh, and gets back the uh, prediction from the modal API and appends it to the JSON record that was already uh, created. And this whole record is now stored in uh, Elasticsearch. So, now, uh, within uh, Expedia, these are the current frameworks that are being used. And for each of the uh, frameworks, we have processing modules implemented, which are able to uh, fetch predictions from the uh, modal endpoint and populate the predictions for the uh, test case failures. So the first framework is Scala test, which is implemented using Scala programming language. And the second one is Nightbot.js, which is implemented using JavaScript programming language. And the third one is Cucumber, whose step definitions uh, implementation is done using uh, Ruby. Okay, now that we have talked about the uh, modal endpoint setup and usage, let's look at some of the uh, prediction category uh, examples from within uh, Expedia test case failures. 
so the first category we have is automation so like we talked about earlier automation uh, represents any locator issues or setup issues or runtime issues that are caused so and uh, also please note that in these examples for simplicity purposes i have included only the failure description or the summary and uh, not the stack trace so okay now let's go through these examples from left to right and top to bottom in that particular order so the first example here says that a null pointer exception was thrown which is a runtime issue and hence classified as automation and the second example says that uh, element is not clickable or uh, could be locator issue and ca uh, categorized as automation here and here it says that the automation was trying to access a method for a null uh, element again uh, automation issue in the fourth example it says that a particular uh, value is uh, not found from the select list in the ui again an automation issue and in the fifth example it says that it's unable to uh, locate a particular uh, element or the object was unknown uh, again an automation uh, issue and in the last example we can say see that it says that the session was terminated uh, because of grid exception and the selenium uh, web driver so this is an example of setup issues again an uh, automation categorization so now let's look at the next category which is uh, environment so uh, like we discussed uh, earlier uh, automation is usually uh, run on pre production um, uh, environments or the test uh, environments and uh, these could have certain stability issues like page load issues or back end service uh, performing uh, stability issues uh, which might cause automation failures and this is what we expect to be categorized as the environment so let's look at the first example here it says that the automation is not on the desired page which is the uh, hotel search page calls it a runtime error but it's an environment stability issue and the second example here uh says that uh, even post multiple retries an element was not found and it's categorized as environment here so like you could see here there could be certain amount of uh, uh, overlap uh, within the uh, automation failure description like it might look very similar but might get categorized into different categories again this is completely dependent on the training data that was fed to the model uh, it could be that the model got certain uh, insights or keywords from the particular failure message to to indicate that uh, it belongs to a particular category okay so let's uh, continue with the uh, example so here it says that navigation to the trips url failed again calls it a runtime error but it could be an environment stability issue and uh, the next example says that the failure message is malformed again an environment issue and uh, the fifth example uh, says that there's no uh, room type um, i mean required room type that is uh, uh, that is expected by the automation from the hotel uh, info site page or details page again an environment uh, issue and the last example uh, again says that uh, the automation is not on the uh, expected page now let's look at the next category uh, which is inventory so uh, like we discussed uh, earlier um, uh, automation is run on pre production environments and the test environments inventory within expedia is quite different uh, than the production uh, inventory that is available and in the test environment uh, inventory sometimes uh, the uh the items could not be available as required by the automation while it is running which could be causing failures so this is expected to be categorized as uh, inventory failures so let's look at some of the examples the first uh, example here says that the uh, search results section itself is not visible definitely an inventory issue and the second example says that the uh, hotel search section uh, element is not uh, available again an inventory issue and here uh, in these two uh, examples what you see as uh, prefixed with uh, alert uh, error uh, these are actually the page failure messages that we talked about earlier which are uh, coming from the uh, ui so now let's look at these examples here it uh, says that uh, uh, we are sold out of rooms for the particular criteria that the automation is looking for clearly an uh, inventory issue and the next example uh, says that there are no results on the page although it calls it calls it a runtime error but it's on the flight page basically uh, the uh, inventory is not available and in the next example it uh, it says that uh, uh, 
it's not able to find a particular trip that is required again an inventory issue and the final example uh, is that the uh, flight search is not working again an uh, inventory issue now let's look at the uh, final category which is product which is expected to represent the actual bugs that are to be uh, reported so the first example says that certain expected sections are not uh, uh, as expected uh, on the HSR page, which is the hotel search results page, and hence categorized as product or a bug. And here uh, in this example and some of the following examples, these are custom uh, error messages which are uh, coming from the automation layer or from any libraries that the automation could be using. So here it says that uh, a particular section is not working as expected, categorized as product. And in the next example, it says that a particular condition is false uh, along with a message to say uh, why the verification has failed. And uh, in the fourth example, it says that an uh, expected message is not displayed uh, on the page. And uh, in the fifth example, it is termed as an assertion failed error and says that a particular option is not in the expected condition. Uh, and in the final uh, example, it says that the uh, search dates on the UI are not as expected by the automation, again, categorized as product. So now that we have seen the uh, examples uh, based on the current data that we have in Elasticsearch, this is how the various uh, predictions or distribution uh, looks like for the automation test failures. So the so most of the predictions uh, are environment category, which accounts for around uh, 65 to 70 percent of the failures. And the next comes the automation category, which accounts for around 45 to 55 percent of the failures. And uh, next comes the product category, which uh, denotes the actual bugs, and it accounts for around 35 to 40 percent of the failures. And uh, the last category is inventory, which uh, accounts for around 15 to 20 percent of the failures. So uh, now my uh, colleague Kirtika would talk about the uh, future work that we could further do in this particular space. Kirtika, over to you. So as per the future work, uh, we have like uh, like we have only tested out with the test results that were uh, you know focused on the product, but there are multiple uh, log mechanisms that are being uh, used in our in our um, you know in our platform. For example, the JS error, JavaScript error that are produced and uh, uh, and uh, you know fetched by Selenium web driver. Uh, so those errors can be used to you know further train the model and further identify the issue and further classify like where the where the platform is failing and where the and what is actually the error. And then there is an exceptions in Splunk. So all the event logs are, uh, all the transaction and event logs are being logged under the Splunk. So we are uh, thinking of, you know, uh, fetching data from Splunk as well and working on that. So then there is a Haystrack trace. So Haystrack is basically the Expedia inbuilt tool. It is now open source. So it is trending tool, uh, basically, uh, and the trend analyzing tool. So there are multiple failures, success rate, uh, and uh, and uh, you know uh, the anomalies that are being uh, surfaced by this tool uh, and logged under it. We are also uh, gonna fetch these uh, anomalies and you know failures and everything, uh, and we'll put into our data and see like how uh, the model and the automation will work. So basically, our idea is to you know use all the data points for the uh, and 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 uh, from the across the platform wherever the error and wherever the failure messages uh, are you know producing wherever the environment is failing and everything so we are basically fetching everything and we are uh, making it more scalable more robust more uh, more global i would say so uh, that is all for the future work and uh, uh, the, uh, and we are now open to your questions. Thank you for the thank you for the uh, thank you for listening and everything. Uh, this is all that we uh, needed to present. Thank you for keeping calm. We have I have seen many Q and A's. I know you guys are interesting. Uh, this is an interesting topic. I totally understand. And uh, it's uh, it's like when whenever we worked upon. It, so uh, it was like for us uh, uh, to you know uh, uh, interesting to implement as well. So now let's uh, handle your questions. Manoj. Sure. Uh, there was a 
pretty uh, interesting talk as as you have been seeing on the uh, panel yeah i was writing um, down one okay that's right cool um the most upvoted question that i see here is how much data you used to classify and you know mm -hmm. and train your model initially okay uh kitika can i take the question yeah sure yeah okay so uh, uh initially we have actually started off with uh, very uh, less data we had because uh, the like kirtika talked about the pre classification is a manual process and uh, hence uh, uh, you know we had to rely on the teams to provide the classification so the rows were almost like uh, 1k to 2k uh, and the last thing that we have were around 3k rows but uh, then what we did is uh, like it got talked about we have involved semi supervised learning where we have uh, put the uh, i mean taken all the unlabeled rows which is all the failure messages without the categorization because we have lots of data so uh, we have taken that and uh, took a promising uh, model to categorize it and fed it back as uh, training data thus creating uh, more data for the model to work with and this has uh, definitely give us uh given us significant uh, improvement in the performance uh plus i would like to add on it like after uh, all the automation that we have uh, did uh, we are now getting around uh, i would say more than 60000 data per minute for training very interesting very interesting um the next question that i see is from abraham um uh, is asking having such a tool Do you still use some manual analysis? If so, then when and how do you know when use manual analysis against fully trusting such tool? Do you miss bugs and what is the ratio that you see? Uh Kirtika shall I take it? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, like we saw i mean although the uh, procession and uh, recall are the scores that we are currently relying on and it's doing quite good and uh, so this like we said we want to uh, or uh, we want to highlight that we are using this to reduce the time uh, that an engineer has to spend not completely replacing it because in some uh, cases it could be that although it gives its uh, initial analysis or the prediction in some cases it could be that the engineer might have to still spend some time to see if the category was different uh, or even when it is categorized as product which is the actual bug it could not be a bug okay so uh, this would still need and uh, we are taking all such again uh, a manually set rows where they say it is a wrong value and set it to the right value and giving it back as uh, feedback to the model so that the metrics and the performance could could further improve so uh, coming to the other part of the question where you asked like uh, did it miss any bugs so so far we are seeing that the categorization for product is is good it is around 35 to 45 uh, 40% of the data obviously like may, maybe few intermittent issues could go and uh, be categorized as environment or uh, automation or something like that but apart from that uh, i think uh, it's not missing most of the bugs Wait. I will take one last question as we are nearly there. Um, so other questions are mostly uh, in some of the internal details. But one question that I see most common is: Is this shareable? Uh, are you have plans to open source, or is it already open sourced? Okay, it's not currently open sourced. We are, we were actually planning to do it before the presentation, but we we were on a uh, time crunch, so uh, we would be uh, open. we are planning to open source it soon with all the documentation required for the setup and stuff as well so probably uh, yeah uh, it will get open source soon that is a really great news to hear that um all right thank you very much anuradha and kritika for your time and such an interesting uh, talk